everyone. Welcome to the Dancing Bear Enlightenment Academy podcast. We air every Monday at 11. And this week we have a very special guest, Idara E. Basie. She is a lawyer, life coach, and corporate energy healer and intuitive. She supports lawyers in moving forward from being stressed out misaligned professionals to peaceful, fulfilled individuals who love their lawyer lives. Welcome, Idara. Thank you so much, Beverly, for that kind introduction. I'm honored to be here. Well, we're grateful to have you. So everyone I talk to always has an incredible personal journey as to how they got started and why this is your profession. So tell us about yours. Okay. All right. Well, you know, back in 2001, probably about March or April, I was working in Washington, D.C. Uh, in fact, I was working at a law firm down the street from the White House and, uh, you know, putting my 10, 11, 12 hour days like my colleagues were. And, um, you know, going back to uh, going back home, you know, and waking up and doing the same thing all over again. So that went on for some time and, you know, surrounded by colleagues who were doing the same thing. So nothing was really out of the ordinary, but just personally speaking deep inside, I felt like, you know, something was off. I wasn't really uh, sold that way of living life, but uh, you know, on the outside, everybody, you know, see uh, you've got the title and you've got the house and you're tooting along so everybody would think that everything is fine but I, I just had this sense that something was awry or something just this sense that come, something was going to come down the pike something was about to happen and um, I have to have a good girlfriend of mine who um, was particularly intuitive in fact she did uh, intuitive readings professionally speaking she was based in Virginia Beach and I just, you know, called her up just to touch base and chat like we do from time to time. And at the close of our conversation, she asked me, well, Idara, when are you moving to California? And I said to myself, California, um, why would I be moving to California? My work is here. The, the gentleman I was dating is here. You know, this is kind of where I'm kind of pitching my tent for the foreseeable future. And he said, yeah, I mean, she's like, I can see you in California as clearly as I can see the hand in front of my face. And with that, you know, I didn't want to offend her or anything. So I just said, oh, yeah, yeah, kind of like just to get her off the phone, basically. But the more I thought about it, the more intriguing a prospect it seemed. And uh, I just happened to be one of those people that's not a big fan of winter so I thought to myself, you know, if I can get the heck out of Dodge before another winter, DC winter, that might be a good thing. And um, so I just casually mentioned it to another girlfriend of mine. Uh, She's a journalist. And I was like, what would you think of if I decided to move to California? And she says, well, yeah, that's fine. But, you know, if you do decide to move, can I buy your house? I've always liked your house. And I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is Thank interesting you. and uh, not too long afterwards the you know the gentleman I was dating just kind of unceremoniously dumped me out of the blue and I just thought I feel like I'm kind of being cleared for takeoff here and so the uh, momentum yeah. just internally started to um, accelerate and I decided well, well heck I'm gonna move to California and I decided on San Diego because I figured, you know, it's big enough of a city that I could at least find a job or mm -hmm. figure out what the heck I was going to do once I was there. And, um, you know, good weather, no, at least no winter anyway. So I, you know, my girlfriend and I, we drew up a contract. We didn't even get a realtor. You know, we just, you know, handled the deal ourselves. And I sold her, sold her my house. I gave away furniture. A lot of blue, black, and gray suits, you know, out the door, and um, pretty much wrapped up everything of my life um, just in time to uh, fly out of the DC area uh, September 10th, 2001. Wow. So the next morning, which was the 11th, 
I got up early that morning and as I always do, I do a lot of content, you know, contemplative work, meditation and what have you. So I got up earlier that morning and just, you know, just thanking the universe for safe travels. I mean, I, I, I more or less did this, you know, this, it, this came together very quickly. So I was, you know, thanking spirit for, you know, having everything come together so smoothly and, yeah. um, and I, you know, arriving safely and what have you. And uh, my cell phone started ringing. And I thought, who would be calling me at this hour, first of all? And, yeah. uh, I, and I didn't tell too many people what I was doing. You know, I had some good friends that I kind of informed one way or the other, but not too many people. But it turned out to be my ex-boyfriend. And um, he said, you know, Idara, I knew that you were flying out, but I didn't know exactly when. So I was calling to see whether you were okay. And I was like, well, why wouldn't I be okay? And he said, well, you haven't turned on your television, have you? I was like, I, I just got here, you know, the day before. Now, my furniture is coming a week from now on the truck. But it turned out that he actually lived in Virginia, not too far away from the Pentagon. So he oh. had been taken by a strange series of explosions and smoke and what have you. So that was oh, his so content. Wow. And um, I, my neighbors, that's how I got to meet my neighbors in San Diego that day. When they found out that I was from the DC area, they kind of more or less yanked me into their living room mm -hmm. and pointed to the television. It's like, that's what's going on right now. And we just really spent the rest of the day just looking at footage one way over and over again about planes going to buildings and um yeah so that that was the the event that really precipitated a real shift for me as far as my way of being in the world and um you know because I was already kind of on the track of trying to change my personal experience Mm -hmm. And then doing that against the backdrop of the paradigm shift that happened in the United States. Yeah. So it was really that event that, um, I mean, again, I was already questioning the professional experience I was having. And I yeah. have always been somebody who questions the status quo, even yeah. if I don't necessarily do anything about it. But I've always kind of like, okay, this is the way reality is presenting. I'm not really sure I'm buying what I'm seeing here. And um, so it was that point in time, um, I had tried to replicate my career, my legal career as I had in Washington, in California, which really kind of petered out after a time, nothing really stuck. And um, I didn't necessarily have to work because I sold my house for a profit so I could live off of those proceeds for a while. And um, so I took that time to write. So that ended up being my first book. And I enrolled in a doctoral program in metaphysical counseling. Um, yeah, because I, I mean, because it's always something, it's always an area of expertise or to, uh, a topic that I was interested in. So I felt like this is something I wanted to do for myself. I didn't know what I was going to do with it or why I felt like this was really the best time to do it. But I mean, again, having time on my hands and um, everything else is being tossed in the air <laughs> as far as you know, my ability to figure out, you know, what's up and what's down. So why not pile another thing on top of, uh, you know, uh, what's, what's on my plate? So that's kind of how my world really, my world percept, uh, my world uh, you know, orientation really shifted. And it was actually 2002 when I started doing um, professional intuitive work with corporate professionals. Um, so, yeah, so that's, it, well, that says, changed my life. Listening, listening to you, you're clearly divinely guided. I mean, the day before 9-11, you're settled <laughs> somewhere else. And <laughs> You absolutely out, oh, absolutely and oh and I yeah. am grateful I I tell you I am grateful and I think it's so funny because I've always told people that I feel like I came out of law school more intuitive than when I went in mm -hmm. and the reason why I say that is that 
um, I happened to attend law school in the South. Mm -hmm. I was the only woman of color in my section. And you, mm -hmm. I find that when you're not supported, when you don't necessarily have the out, outer validation, um, mm -hmm. there was no constituency of people cheering me on, per se. Oh, okay. You're really forced to go within. So mm -hmm. I, I can't say that I really started um, most of my spiritual practices, but looking back, I think that's when I really started wow. cultivating inner resources because I had, I told myself, it's like, if you want to come out of this halfway rational, you're going to have to, you know, start cheering on yourself type of thing. And it was um, after, actually, after I left law school, I started a daily meditation practice, which emerged into, you know, convening with my guides. And so, yeah, but the seed I think was planted when I was in that kind of pressure cooker yeah, yeah. and situation just worked out yeah wow. yeah but uh, you know yeah this, this work out I well I I mean I I think <laughs> I, I think you can say that looking back but when I was in the situation I, was, I wasn't oh. quite sure how the things were going to come together seriously and um when I think about how my work was evolved had evolved to where it is now I mentioned that in 2002, that I was doing readings for mm -hmm. professionals. But my intention was to keep that life very separate from my legal work. Mm -hmm. Because I know that the legal profession is a pretty conservative one. And, and that went on for some time until about 2014, 2015, when I received a phone call from a local attorney here in Atlanta, where I'm based. Um, I, I've received certs, uh, uh, particular certifications in many energy healing modalities. And um, so one of the modalities that I use in my work, I was a member of a, a, a practitioner directory, you know, just so people can find out, you know, see mm -hmm. practitioners locally. So she had gotten a hold of that directory and saw that she, uh, that I was also in the Atlanta area. And she specifically pointed me out because she knew that I was a lawyer. She herself being an attorney herself. So I thought, oh, I didn't expect for these two worlds to collide, but here we are. <laughs> And um, it was magnificent working with her. I, I think we probably worked together for almost a year and a half. Um, I mean, just, and then she started referring me to like-minded lawyers also. I mean, so I would have to imagine an attorney like her that avails herself of a energy healing modality is already on that path. And she also hangs around lawyers that are inclined to either path. do, yeah, on the, either on that path or interested in doing personal development work, even if they're not, mm -hmm. you know, attached to a specific modality. So that's what kind of tweaked the focus of my public work when we, we got together. Um, so it was at that time it occurred to me that, okay, well, maybe I can kind of rebrand my work as, as kind of a specialized version of wellness because mm -hmm. um, lawyer wellness is a, a very much a thing. Mm -hmm. um, the profession is experiencing a fair amount of crisis as far as chronic stress, uh, depression, chemical dependency, um, any number of things. So I'm approaching this whole world from the perspective of um, I would like to say, I'd like to call it the inner life of lawyering, basically, in that I'm looking at, you know, the inner, the, the emotional and the um, spiritual well-being that these professionals have, uh, how they can maintain it, how they can amplify it in this very contentious profession. So that is... Um, an interesting perspective because when, when you think about wellness or when lawyers think about wellness or just generally speaking, people are like, oh yeah, you know, take a walk every 
20 minutes or, you know, or, you know, drink your water, or, you know, whatever. I mean, physical wellness, those type of things. But I am very much of the opinion that how you express externally is a reflection of what's going on within. Internally, yeah. yeah. And rather than wait for the proverbial two by four or crisis, which unfortunately for many people, that's what it takes. Yeah. Why don't we get proactive about um, working in ways or trying to develop ways to work in ways that are more aligned with your values? Because so much stress occurs or flows out of working at cross purposes to what you're all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems very, um, it seems like very obvious, but if you, for example, if you prioritize time spent with your family and know that's a critical part of your well being, and you consistently find yourself in the office at 10 30 at night, guess what? You're not going to be a happy camper. Right. You're not going to do good work. You're not, and your family life is going to suffer. So we need to make some decisions about how to realign your work experience with your cherished values. Your employer's better off for it and you are better off for it. And again, it's, done. <laughs> yeah, you get more done. You get more done. And again, it seems very obvious, but my job is to systematically walk people through the various aspects of their lawyer lives and say, hey, look, let's look at the lay of the land here, mm -hmm. see what we can do to tweak X, Y, and Z, and what have you. Um, so you don't end up perpetually, uh, I think of Sisyphus rolling that big rock up the hill. I mean, that's not sustainable for how many oh. 20, 30, 40 years that you plan to be employed. Yeah. you know, or what have you, or whether even a law firm working, doing the law firm thing is really for you. Maybe there are other areas of law that are more aligned with what you believe in, or there are causes that you like to support, and you want to use your legal skills in that capacity, or what have you. So um, one thing that I say a lot, that I firmly believe, I am very, very adamant that I feel that the status quo is just a serving suggestion. And I'll explain what the, a serving suggestion. When you, for example, when you go to a grocery store and you see a can of peas and they have a little writing on a serving suggestion, that's just one way, that's just one way that you can serve those peas or eat those peas. If it doesn't work for you, maybe you need to serve it in another way. Yeah. So having that mindset is about looking at the dominant paradigm, the present reality, as far as the lawyer narrative is concerned, and keep in mind that it's only one way, only one way that that lawyer life can unfold. There are a myriad of different iterations. And again, that seems very obvious. But if you are in a situation or in a thinking space where you feel like you are stuck doing this drudgery from here until you're the next incarnation, you are not going to be open to making adjustments because you don't even realize that making adjustments is a possibility. So this starting- this is probably yeah. too for every profession, not just lawyers. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think it's the the, the nature of the uh, the contentious aspect of the profession, lawyer, many aspects huh? of it, that people that really kind of get people down, or make, or I mean, these the the adversarial system we have bring out the worst oh, really? of people. Um, I mean, God bless the family lawyers. I mean, because, you know, I, I made a, oh, an yeah. ill, 
you know, when you're in the middle of a divorce situation or you're looking, I mean, what there's some areas of laws that are more, uh, uh, more treacherous than others. Treacherous. Well, I'm, I'm just saying, and as a advocate in that environment, you almost get vicarious trauma mm. by default, just by being exposed to it, participating in it, what have you. So, and so my thing is, if that's the situation, and you, even if you're not immediately able to make adjustments in your work, you have to incorporate things in your life that um, kind of ease that stress that you are subject to day in, day out. Otherwise, um, you know, you're you're not you're of no help to somebody who needs your assistance if you are if you've fallen out somewhere. You know, I mean, it will be a matter of somebody just like, oh, pity, we didn't, we didn't know he was so stressed. And, and we'll just yeah. step over you and go to the next yeah. associate. Not bad, huh? Yeah, well, you so, know, it, it's a thing. Nobody's indispensable, even though you think you are while you're in the midst of it. But you know, well, I worked for years at a company that took care of people. Uh, we didn't throw them away. <laughs> well, I, then you're, you're very fortunate. You're very yeah. fortunate. And I think there's more attention being paid to those type of things now, but um, it's been a long time coming. It's, it's been a long time do. coming, yeah. yeah. So what is the typical or most common issue you find among the people you're working with? Well, I um, mean, uh, stress, I think is the biggest, it's the biggest thing. Yes. Yeah, chronic around stressed out people. <laughs> yeah, you've got stressed out clients. Uh, you've got um, deadlines, metrics to meet. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you've got the pressure of always needing to uh, being in a situation where you need to know the answer type thing. So it's hard for you to even admit that you don't always know the answer. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, you think about the world that we're living in these days. Um, there's a lot going on, <laughs> yeah. mildly. Um, so, I mean, and so this is all, of course, in addition to your family obligations and whatever obligations you have uh, as far as running your respective households and things. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty big so, thing. Do you have any special techniques or uh, ways that you have uh, little secrets for dealing with these uh, folks? Well, you know, I, again, uh, the first thing that I alluded to uh, a few minutes ago is that we need to identify what you stand for as far as your personal values are concerned. I um, have developed a, an online course called Creating a Lawyer Life You Love, where I walk my students systematically towards getting articulating, okay, your physical health your emotional health, your spiritual health. We divide up your life into its major components and really get you to sit down and think, what do you stand for? What is optimal? What are the optimal, what is your optimal definition of wellness in this particular area of your life? Write it down, figure it out. Don't just guess because you're, this is your life. And, for, and there's so many people who haven't given that much thought and um, wonder why they're not, why they're just spinning their wheels. It's like, well, because you don't know where you stand. You know, you haven't prioritized articulating your values. And um, you might think this is an intangible thing, but how are you going to know if you are moving the needle on making desired changes if you don't know where you, from point A to point B, presupposes you know where point A is. Yeah. For so many people, they don't know what point A is. So that's number, I think that's like baseline as far as work is concerned. And then for, for people who have done some inner work, I mean, there, there are some lawyers that have done some, uh, some kind of personal development work 
a, some, some very iteration thereof, you may be more inclined to know what you stand for, but you still aren't making positive changes or you're not making the changes that you need to make. And for those kind of people, I would, um, I do a lot of energy healing work. We would look at that particular challenge and um, assess what's going on energetically from blocking you from making those changes that you know you need to make. And um, once you remove these blocks, you will be more available to implementing um, desire changes. And actually, um, I would say, you know, creating new neural pathways where these new behaviors are becoming, you know, um, par for the course rather than, oh, I know I should do X, Y, Z. I know I should do X, Y, and Z. And six months later, X, Y, and Z still hasn't been done. Well, I, I mean, I, I always, yes, I always decide, I always let people know that your patterns teach you something. Yeah. They're not there just to frustrate you. They're there to give you information. And um, if you can stay out of a space of judgment about them, get the information, get the learning and leverage it to make positive changes. Now, like I mentioned earlier on, for so many people, it takes a crisis to kind of get things going. And if that's where people are at, well, I mean, that's where they're at. I mean, I, I, again, it's not my place to judge, but um, I am really team proactive. I, I really think it's preferable to make changes before you're forced to make them. Yeah. You know, I mean, I just, I mean, it, it, you can't, uh, you know, why wait till your arm is falling off? Just, just take care of your arm. And, <laughs> and you won't be inclined. Brush your teeth. Yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah, brush the teeth, keep, brush the teeth that you want to keep as right. opposed to like, oh, I need three root canals. But again, yes, yes. But again, I do realize that different people learn in different ways. And, um, you know, you just meet people where they're at, but um, I try to do prioritize self-care as we go along with the idea that we kind of keep the drama to, uh, to uh, you know, a reasonable yeah, level. level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how has this work affected you personally? Well, you know, it, it's very interesting because, um, that series of events that happened around September 11th really forced me to start trusting myself to a degree that I hadn't to that level. I, again, it wasn't like I hadn't heard of intuition or um, you know the spiritual work that was completely no. No, I had been doing spiritual work or at least reading about it. Um, for a couple of years. So it wasn't completely new, but to have that kind of life um, reset, that was huge. I mean, I really think it changed the, the trajectory of my entire life. And um, like, and especially when you are trying to do something that, that's new or different, there isn't an instruction manual Right. about how, yeah, how the pieces are supposed to come together. So I had to really walk in a lot of trust that, um, I mean, I can look, I mean, like you said, I can look back, you know, like look back in the past and say, oh, I was guided. But at that time, there are a lot of people who thought I was nuts. You know, I just, I mean, it was just like, and it's so funny because people are either they're just like either either you're nuts or you're very brave. And I didn't really resonate with either per se. I mean, I do tend to be a pretty practical person. And I thought to myself, well, here I am working in the DC area. I'm getting more and more, more miserable by the day. So if I do something different, there is a possibility of becoming a little less miserable. That's the way I looked at it. Seriously, it was a very practical. I was like, I, 
don't, I'm digging a deeper and deeper hole by continuing to do what I'm doing here. So let me stop digging and try something else. And even if that something else doesn't work, at least I won't be freezing my butt off in DC. So that's kind of where I was coming from. But people were looking at me like I had three heads and um, I, I'm, I'm kind of used to that by now, but I, I just really didn't think about it in terms of being personally brave. I just looked at it as if, I don't think I'm traveling the path that I'm meant to be traveling. Even if I couldn't necessarily articulate what the alternative was, I was like, it's not this. That no. I could say. Well, good for you, because when you're unhappy, you don't keep going down the same road because it's well, I know. <laughs> I know, but you know, I think a lot of people get used to the drudgery and just figure this is this is it. And I'm like, mm, no, no, I'm I'm still no, I'm, I'm again it's the status quo. This is just one iteration of reality. And um, again, I have to refer to one of my favorite quotes by um, Albert Einstein, the level of consciousness that created a situation yeah. <laughs> is not the level of consciousness that's gonna move us beyond that situation. Yeah. I say that all the time. And I think, I think it informs my work today when I try to convey to lawyers, it's like, hey, look, you have been, I mean, for lack of a better word, indoctrinated in a certain way of how to be in the world, you know, primarily uh, left brain. And um, how's that working for you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, and it's, and it's still kind of a, it's kind of a, a little bit of a tough sell because I mean, we've expended so much time and energy and money on problem solving from a particular vantage point. And then society rewards you for being really good at that. So, and again, I, I don't recommend or I don't advocate that we toss our left brain, our critical thinking skills out the window. No. But um, it needs going strictly, yeah, I mean, going strictly through our intellect has left us wanting clearly. So we need to be open to new um, sources of information and wisdom and insight to make sure that we look, we can look at things holistically mm -hmm. and cover more of the bases versus, you know, okay, my intellect, my intellect, my intellect, and wonder why we're still miserable. Intellect won't make you happy. <laughs> no, it doesn't. And again, that that's a hard sell for people who make their living, you know, um, you know, honing a very high level of expertise with their critical thinking skills. But I, um, it's a matter of pulling in some additional, um, additional um, skill sets, which is one thing that I like to do to help yeah. lawyers amplify them. So you also have a PhD that you talked about. Tell us about your dissertation. Sure, sure. I, as I mentioned, when I shortly after I got to San Diego, I started my doctoral program in metaphysical counseling. And um, that is a body of knowledge that looks beyond what we see through the physical eyes and um, encourages a level of connection with our divine selves. So metaphysical thing really is about connecting people to their inner divinity, which is a message that you don't necessarily get in the mainstream because we're looking to other people like the Pope or the deacon or the pastor. Those are the people that have the uh, qualifications or the standing or the worth or value to connect with spirit. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. You have just as much skill and ability to connect with your larger being as anybody else with a big robe. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so that's, I mean, so that's the bigger picture. So my spiritual, my thesis focused on, um, and it's funny, I wrote it around the 
time when Enron was unraveling. Oh, wow. And it's so funny because we thought, surely this is the worst corporate malfeasance we will ever see. And well, the universe said, hold my beer. <laughs> like this was just the beginning. But um, I ran across a quote by Cheryl Richardson and she said something to the fact that just, it hit me like a ton of bricks. She said, the, the downfall of a corporation is linked to um, unhealed individuals holding leadership positions. And I thought, wow. Wow, yeah. I was like, okay. So it's like the, so it's like looking at corporations as an energetic conscious entity and its ability to evolve or its impact in the marketplace is limited by the level of consciousness of the folks that are the head honchos. So I was looking at that concept from the vantage point of um, how spiritual principles could play out in corporate environments, which is really the essence of my work. I mean, because I'm straddling the fence between you know, this metaphysical law and, universe, and, and, you know, and earthly law and serving as a bridge between the two and just working with legal professionals as a conduit, an agent for enlightened consciousness in these, um, in these either their law firms or other organizations where they provide services. So I think um, just so evaluating how uh, the role of somebody like a spiritual counselor, which is essentially what I am, um, mm -hmm. how they can begin to shift the energy in corporate settings. And, um, and the reason why I say energy is because, you know, corporations really are energetic entities. They're just composed yeah. of, the, of the individual's who, whose consciousness came together under the umbrella of a unified entity, a unified mission, whatever yeah. the mission of that corporation is. And um, so if you have, you know, the leadership and the organization, you know, out to lunch as far as their personal development is concerned, and then you have, you know, varying levels of leadership who are in various stages of despair, uh, or folks that don't feel like they are respected or honored or valued. You've got, uh, on, on the macro level, you've got this gunk going on. And again, I, I, I use the word spiritual because that's kind of where I'm coming from, but it can be as simple as, um, as corporate leadership demonstrating a value of personal development. I mean, you don't have to, I mean, this is not religion per se. This is like some kind of inner reflection. If people who are working in a corporate setting look at their leadership leading the way as far as, okay, we're gonna have workshops on, on a stress, a stress relief, or we're going to offer yoga programs, or I'm gonna take the lead in showing people that yes, this vacation time that you have been granted is actually meant to be used, you know? Uh, I mean, seriously, I mean, I, because yeah. I was just reading an article today about how corporations are starting to tell their employees that your vacation time is mandatory. Because, yeah, because the vacation time is there, but everybody's too scared to take it, to um, take off because they're trying to keep their jobs. So if you see the CEO, taking time off, or if you see him coaching his, his son's little league team, those type of activities demonstrate a certain level of values. Mm -hmm. They tell the other employees that, okay, these are things that the leadership values. So it's not like you need permission to value, them, value themselves, but you would feel better working for an organization where the leadership 
so obviously prioritizes their family yeah. or volunteers for a particular cause um, because it's showing that, okay, you can be a, a, a full rounded person. You're just not a machine fulfilling a particular job title description. You know, we want you to be a full fulfilled person, you know, and the reason why we want you to feel, because that's what we're doing. See what I'm saying? So it's like, and it, again, it seems really simple, but folks that are leading the charge need to lead the charge from a holistic vantage point. Yeah. Yes, profits are important, of course. No, I mean, nobody's going to, going to um, argue about that, but it's, it's, it's also not everything. Important. Yeah, it's, it's not everything. And for example, maybe the corporation might prioritize, okay, how are we impacting the community where we do our work? How are we relating to the people that live in the area, the stakeholders, the various stakeholders that um, are impacted by our operation one way or the other? And to, and to show people that they care about these types of things. It shifts the culture. That's how you shift culture, you know? So, um, yeah. Well, it's been really wonderful talking to you. Um, how can people learn about the work that you do? Sure, absolutely. Well, you can visit my website at www.loveyourlawyerlife.com. That's all one word. And that will give you the kick tac caboodle of all the services that I offer. And um, so you and then I'm also on LinkedIn at Idera E. Bassey as well. And um, that's where you where I tend to hang my hat most frequently. You see, I provide a lot of my writings and um, interact with um, you know folks that are asking questions about these type of topics that we just talked about today. So uh, those are two really great places to find me. And I'm more than happy to uh, chat with folks about uh, what, I'm, what I'm up to. And don't you have a free gift PDF for our audience? Yes, I do have an ebook on stress relief for lawyers. Um, yes, yes. Uh, uh, surprising ways to uh, bring about emotional well being. So um, I also would love to make that available to people, which gives you an overview of a lot of the techniques that I use and um, that you can start availing yourself up to uh, bring about more emotional well-being in your lawyer life. Cool. And all of those links, by the way, will be down below. So you can find her website, her LinkedIn, and the link to her free gift. If you're on the podcast, I'm sorry, we don't have the link right now. You'll have to come over to YouTube and uh, find the link there. So Idara, it's so wonderful talking to you. Do you have any closing words for everyone? Well, you know, I, I think there's something to be said about cultivating joy. Mm -hmm. Joy is important. My company name is actually Joy, joy Legal LLC. And the reason why is I, I like to think of in these times where you get a narrative on the television about everything falling apart, unraveling with some regularity, Cultivating joy becomes almost a form of rebellion. And uh, that's all I'm, I'm all about, challenging the status quo yeah. and helping my clients do that in a way that's sustainable. And um, so I'm bringing about more joy in your lawyer life. I'm for it. I'm all for and it. And in all your lives, whether you're a lawyer or not. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely, no doubt about that. I just, uh, you know, that just happens to be where I hang my hat. But uh, joy, whatever we can do to bring more joy in our respective life experiences, it can be just as contagious as other things that people think are contagious. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And remember, everyone, to be the light you want to see in the world. 
And thank you for joining us on our podcast today. Mm-hmm.